We have always been and still are being ignored. Nobody listens to us. Once so big and powerful, but today in recession. Because they are fed up with it. <laughs> enough is enough. After my visit to London and Grace Blakely, the trail of mutiny brings me to Berlin in Germany. Once so big and powerful, but today in recession. I've been in Berlin before. I presented my previous book here in German. I went to the memorial plaque for Rosa Luxemburg, the revolutionary activist who was murdered in 1919. Today, I'm going to the Bundestag in Berlin, which is the parliament in Germany. And that's where I'm meeting Sevim Dagdelen. Sevim is a really impressive woman. She used to work at the airport and clean planes. And she was also active in the union at the time. And then in 2005, she was elected to the German parliament. From trade unionist to member of parliament, an impressive step. And in her office, right in the middle of Berlin, Sevim has coffee and tea ready. She welcomes me with open arms and tells me about the state of Germany. Yes, food prices have increased by 9% in the last month alone, in August 2023, and energy prices arose by 8.3%. In August? In August. Are energy prices rising again? They will rise again, yes. So we now have a 9% increase in food prices in August. That is, basic products such as bread, rice and flour, those are 9% more expensive. It's becoming increasingly difficult for more and more people to make ends meet financially, and we have the problem that more than 2 million people already depend on food banks. Last year, two million people were dependent on food banks. We have a very strong impoverishment of large parts of the population who simply can no longer afford many things because the prices keep increasing. In one of the richest economies on the planet, Germany, 11.4% of the population cannot afford a nutritious meal at least every day. This is an unimaginable number because we're talking about more than 10 million people. It's similar to what Grace told me in the previous episode. Countries with rich economies where the population barely makes ends meet. A lot of the world probably thinks of the UK as a rich economy, and it is, but we are seeing levels of poverty and destitution, indebtedness, homelessness that we haven't seen in, in decades. A big part of it is the cost of living crisis. In the history of the Federal Republic of Germany, 2022 was the year with the largest real wage losses for workers. There was a decline of 4%. Wages were 4% lower? Yes, 4% lower. And on the other hand, we have DAX companies that are making exorbitant profits. If you look at the operating profits of 40 DAX companies, they have a total of 171 billion euros. 40 DAX companies? Yes, 40 DAX companies. So 171 billion euros profit on the one hand and a loss of real wage of 4% for workers on the other. The DAX 40 are the 40 largest listed companies in Germany. These include Adidas, Rheinmetall and BMW, for example. And these companies are doing well. But Sevim says, that while capital is piling up at the top of society, poverty is growing at the bottom. Germany has the largest low-wage sector in the whole of Europe. Chancellor Schwauder even boasted that he had created the largest low-wage sector, which means that it's not the wages that are to blame. It is not the wages, it is the profits, in addition to the rising energy prices that are driving inflation in this country. Are profits rising more than average? Yes, profits are rising more than average. 
And these profits, as well as the high energy prices, drive inflation, not the wages. We have a statutory minimum wage of 12 euros, which means bitter poverty for millions of workers in Germany. 12 euros an hour is just not enough. Even the federal government itself says this. When we ask them how much money does someone have to earn per hour in order not to fall below the subsistence level, the federal government then responds, it's about 13 euros. Euro 50 or something like that. So the minimum wage itself is bitter poverty and that is simply ludicrous. But you can see that Chancellor Scholz is no guarantee for social policy. Of course, he is falling because he is pursuing policies that are increasingly leading people to become more and more impoverished. Look, at his minimum wage increase of about 40 cents, from which you can't even buy a sandwich in Germany these days. Working people are struggling. Grace Blakely already explained how this was due to the difficult restart after Corona, the big company's hunger for profit and climate change. And now Sevim tells me about a fourth cause. This has had a major impact in Germany in particular, the war in Ukraine and the sanctions against Russia. To understand that, we have to start at BASF, the big chemical giant in Germany. And for my book, I spoke with Liam, who works at BASF Ludwigshaven as a process operator. Gas is the basis for BASF, Liam explains. After all, gas provides the necessary energy for production, but also serves as a basic product for producing ammonia, for example. BASF has always operated on cheap Russian gas since the Second World War. And then, after Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, Russia was sanctioned. Import of cheap Russian gas was largely blocked and all of a sudden BASF had to buy their gas elsewhere at a much higher price. People at home saw their bills rise rapidly and BASF saw its profits shrink. It is what it is. We have heard that many economic institutes, even the German Institute of Economics, says that there is a threat of de-industrialization in Germany. BASF is one example. There are many other energy intense sectors, companies, industries, that simply can't afford the prices here anymore. And that, of course, is a self-damaging policy that the federal government is pursuing here. It damages the German economy and so, of course, the prosperity of millions of people here. In the end, many people were fired at BASF. Liam doesn't know what's going to happen to him yet. The sanctions that were intended to hit Russia are mainly shooting their own people in the foot. Germany has fallen into recession jobs are disappearing and energy bills remain sky high. Rising food prices, rising energy prices, two million people that have to go to the public food banks. This war that is taking place in Ukraine and the consequences of the reaction of the West, namely the economic sanctions. That makes it so that we have a social war against the population in Germany, where the rich are getting richer. A social war against the population. That's what Sevim calls the consequences of the choices made by Germany when the war broke out. Choices. Men in suits make choices about arms deliveries and economic sanctions. But these are not the same people who are now queuing up at the food bank. Strange then that they think that the Germans are just going to accept those choices. The federal government only represents interests. They only represent interest. And these interests are not those of the German people or the European people. Because you can see that there is a policy of austerity in social policy. But on the other hand, there is an enormous debt, an enormous debt for armaments and the military. That is worth pouring money into, right? The 100 billion euros that Chancellor Schultz Promised last year in his Setemwenden speech, that 100 billion does not even exist. It has not been gathered, nor has it been earned. 
These are all debts. These are special debts that are incurred for the military and the armaments. And at the same time, on the other hand, cuts are being made everywhere in social policy. And that means, of course, the government is incurring a debt for the military and for the armaments of the expense of the taxpayers. The fact that this money was found so quickly also shows that they were willing to incur debts for armaments and military expenses, but not for social policy. This war is really not just a proxy war. It is also a social war against the people. We are currently having discussions in the German parliament about the budget. And in this budget, the government has done something unique in the world. They achieved something astonishing, achieved in quotation marks, that is to say, they have increased spending on armaments and the military to 85.5 billion euros, according to NATO criteria. That's an increase of 32 billion euros, an increase of almost 25%. In other words, they have increased spending on armaments and the military by 25%. Is that annual? Yes, of course. So for next year, that's for next year. And since the beginning of this government, of this traffic light coalition since 2021, the balance of the SPD, Greens and Liberals, in this government has been increased of plus 37% for armaments and the military since they have been in government. And we now have a budget where we spend 85.5 billion on armaments and the military. But at the same time, we live in a country where 25% of all fourth graders, that is the quarter of all fourth graders, of all children who go to the fourth grade in Germany can neither read properly, nor write properly, nor do maths properly. So much money spent on weapons. It's unbelievable. It's mainly NATO that is pushing for this, says Sevin. NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It's the largest military alliance in the world, and it's led by the United States. NATO was founded during the Cold War, when the United States and the Soviet Union faced each other. But the Soviet Union disappeared in 1991, and yet NATO remained as a so-called defensive organization. But the wars that NATO was going to wage against Afghanistan, against Iraq, against Libya, showed otherwise. NATO now requires its member states to spend at least 2% of their domestic product on defense each year, 2% of all their annual wealth. That money will not go to education, not to healthcare, and not to housing. The European member states are therefore caught between a rock and a hard place. They have to spend more and more money on military spending and at the same time cut more on social spending. BAFOG is a scholarship for pupils who come from parents and families who are on low incomes. Students get BAFOG scholarships so that these students have money to pay for their books or other things that they need. They made cuts in BAFOG of about 27 to 28 percent. Cuts on school scholarships? So 85 billion of the one side for armaments and the army, an increase of around 25 percent. Yet on the other side, cuts are being made for the children on BAFOG scholarships. And on top of that, there will be a 90 3% cut on Mutten's Genesen's work that is helping young mothers. And also a 93% cut on youth holiday centers. There are cuts on everything. There are also cuts on vacation centers for low-wage families. So it hits the working class. They're supposed to finance the military budget through social cuts. And the reason for this is, of course, the war in Ukraine. Every euro, you can only spend it once. Either you will spend it on the bar for scholarships, on youth education centers, on maternity care, on families, or you just spend it on armaments and the military, on ammunition, on tanks, and on fighter jets, and so on. And that is the absurdity of the fact that so much is being cut at the expense of German taxpayers. It is a brutal, brutal social war. War costs money, and this puts a lot of pressure on social spending. 
education, healthcare, social security, this is not only the case in Germany, but also elsewhere in Europe. In 2024, the European Union wants to save 45 billion euros. That's a huge amount of money. You can pay 1 million nurses or 1.5 million teachers with that. This means that the rigid and strict austerity policy is back in Europe, with all the consequences that entails. Globally, more and more people are joining a union. It's really increasing on a global level. Here in Berlin, I meet up with some Amazon trade unionists to catch up. We drink a beer in the pavilion of the Weltwirtschaft by the Spree River. I met them at Manifiesta, our annual solidarity festival in Ostend. To my great surprise, they told me that their trip to Manifiesta was a smooth one. In Belgium, the train journey went fantastically smoothly, they told me. And in Germany, the railway situation is much more problematic. I didn't expect that at all, because in my head, Germany was the land of efficiency, the country where everything leaves on time and arrives on time. Apparently not. Ongoing austerity has done away with that cliché. You only have to take the train once in Germany. Then you see, well, you're lucky if you arrive at your destination at all. When you arrive, or how you arrive, is a different question entirely. Because when it's hot, for example, the air conditioning doesn't work. And when it's cold, the heating doesn't work. It happens very often in the Deutsche Bahn, in addition to all these delays. We have bridges in poor condition, we have roads in poor conditions, we have plaster that comes off the walls when a student is sitting in school. When I go to school in Germany, it's just a picture of sadness. It's depressing. You don't want to go to the toilets anymore, for example, in a primary school or in a secondary school because it's falling apart. And that has to do with this policy, which is only focused on spending more and more money on the military and on armaments, but simply no longer invest in its own country's infrastructure, railways, education, you know. But we also have another very radical problem, for example, and that is the hospitals. The healthcare system in Germany is about to collapse. The same goes for every war. The rich provide the weapons and the poor provide the victims. Poor people, workers, children, peasants, boys or nameless mercenaries are left for dead on the battlefield. On the Ukrainian side, construction workers, market vendors and workers from local furniture companies are fighting. The trenches are filled with young people from poor regions. It's no different on the Russian side. The young soldiers come from the poor regions of the Russian Federation. You don't see the sons of the Russian elite there. Ordinary people wage war on the battlefield and ordinary people feel the consequences in their daily lives at home. This war is being financed by social cuts. And that is why it is important that the peace movements, the trade unions that are against the war, do not allow themselves to be intimidated. And that we exert more pressure against the social war, against our own people. Don't be intimidated, says Sevim. That's important because the opponent won't back down for anything. For years, the elite has been trying to get on the good side of Russian President Putin. And when Putin launched his dirty war against Chechnya, people like Belgian Prime Minister Guy Verhofstadt and British Prime Minister Tony Blair knocked down the doors of the Kremlin. They signed arms contracts with Putin until their arms hurt. And now, all of a sudden, those same people are big opponents of Putin and accuse us, who've always been against the war, of being Putin's friends. It seems like Putin has allies in this parliament. It's nothing more than intimidation by forces that want to continue the war at all costs. This starts with the debate in the media. All those who are against armed deliveries, against military aid, against escalation, are labelled as Russian agents. This has a lot to do with the fact that the debates and the discourses in the USA spill over here. The defaming, the discrediting, the cancelling, the cancel culture. People are intimidated. They even try to intimidate the peace movement so that they do not open their mouths. 
They are not active. They do not protest. They try to sow discord within the movement by turning people against each other and saying that some are too Russia-friendly, others are right-wing. There is an incredible attempt to fragment and divide the peace movement. In that discourse, there's no room for context. However, context is necessary to achieve peace in the end. Everyone has forgotten, but in the early 2000s, the West was still enthusiastic about Putin. At the time, Putin wanted a trade agreement with the European Union and even wanted to become a member of NATO. But the West brushed off those questions and treated Russia as a defeated regional power, only good for supplying raw materials to the West. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, NATO had promised Russia that NATO would not advance further towards Russia. But that happened anyway, both in 1999 and in 2004. And when NATO announced again in 2008 that both Ukraine and Georgia would become members, Russia had had enough. Everyone knows that this is the red line for Moscow. Both German Chancellor Angela Merkel and French President Nicolas Sarkozy had explicitly advised Washington against expanding NATO. But the United States still pushed ahead in its will. And at that point, Putin's attitude had completely changed. But one thing must not be forgotten. It has also been one of NATO's major geopolitical goals, this expansion of NATO towards the East, and that is, of course, NATO is of national interest in Germany, and this also includes support for this eastward expansion of NATO. Even though there have been critical voices who repeatedly adhere to the policies of the detente pursued by Willy Brandt, the former Social Democratic Chancellor, and who advocated good neighbourly relations with Russia and have been against eastward expansion because they have said that this would provoke Russia. We promised at the time of reunification that we would not expand towards Russia, and we should keep our word. But these voices exist, but they're not loud enough. The others now have the upper hand in the discussions. But the discussions exist everywhere. When Russia invaded Ukraine, just about every country condemned the illegal invasion, and rightly so. The countries in the South especially know how important sovereignty is. But the sanctions, that's another story. Only 52 countries have supported the economic sanctions against Russia, while 127 countries do not support them. 127, that's a remarkably large number. Those countries do not want to be dragged into a logic of war that is not theirs. They see that Washington is applying double standards. There are 10 or 11 sanction packages being imposed on Russia, but not a single sanction is imposed on Israel, despite 104 United Nations resolutions condemning the apartheid regime and colonization. So my experience is when I'm traveling in Latin America, when I'm traveling to Africa or even Asia, the countries are just fed up with the West. They're fed up with what they are preaching. Why is that? First of all, they are fed up because the West uses an incredible double standard. Let me give you an example. 20 years ago, the US and their so-called coalition of the willing attacked Iraq and bombed it. Over a million people have died. To this day, the country suffers from this war which violates international law. And the German government and the Green-led foreign ministry in Germany under Annalena Barbock says they cannot access this war under international law. They do not want to access this as a war of aggression. There is an unbelievable double standard. Hypocrisy. International law is only ever brought up when it is not involving one's own allies, if it is not one of the NATO countries. But when the NATO countries violate international law, torture prisoners, or have Guantanamo, they simply remain silent. More and more countries are fed up with hypocrisy and double standards. It's for this reason that they did not vote in favor of the sanctions against Russia, and that was a huge shock to Washington. Fiona Hill, for example, a former member of the United States National Security Council, spoke of it as a real disgrace. 
and she called it mutiny. That vote, she said, was mutiny and rebellion. By the way, that's where I got the title of my book and my docu-series. The Growing Mutiny Against Washington's Orders. This means that these countries no longer want to have anything to do with the West because of the double standards. And of course, they now have the so-called BRICS, so Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa came together as an alliance for an economic cooperation. They want a policy of dialogue rather than one of confrontation. For those countries, BRICS is an alternative to the West. In this respect, I actually see it as a turning point in international politics, in international relations. I believe in a just society. That's why I'm fighting for it. And not only in Germany, but also internationally. I believe in just trade relations, I believe in fair trade relations. And I also have hope because of the coming together of BRICS countries, for example. That also gives me hope, because I think that the United States will not be able to rule the world for much longer with its dollar as a weapon. And if there is this possibility that the dollar can no longer be used as a weapon because there are alternatives, because there are alternative reserve currencies, because trade can also be carried out in other currencies. That actually gives me hope. There are, of course, more signs that show that this is possible to put an end to these unfair, belligerent relationships and to enter into relationships based on peace, dialogue and cooperation. That gives me hope and we have no other choice. My conversation with Sevim is almost over. We've talked about rising food prices and how that also relates to the sanctions against Russia. Sanctions that, by the way, have missed their target. Because while the economy is doing quite well in Russia, Germany has fallen into recession. Working people are impoverished. There's a threat of deindustrialization and job losses. We also talked about money for weapons instead of money for hospitals and teachers. A war, a social war against the people, as Sevim so aptly put it. Sevim is an impressive character. She was born in Germany and her father was brought from Turkey to work in the German steel industry. She then went to work at the airport. She has always maintained that class position, even in Parliament. As well as her international view of the world, far beyond the borders of Germany and the borders of Europe. And I find that incredibly inspiring about Sevim. The world is so much bigger than Europe. And if you don't broaden your view, then you will be left behind. And that is what is happening to Europe now. Of course, in its loyalty to the United States, Europe is heading towards its downfall. And if you don't look at developments around the world, then you have a problem. And the politics actually start with a look at reality, at the real world. And what does the world look like today? And if you don't know that, you can't do politics. And part of politics is to know what international developments are happening. Secondly, it is particularly important for me, as a left person, of course, that I show international solidarity with the exploited, with oppressed peoples, with the working class of the other countries. For me, this is the benchmark of left-wing politics. I come from a working-class background, so I also object to us oppressing the working class in other countries through our hegemonic claims. The workers of Deleuze in Belgium, the workers of Amazon in Germany, the nurses in England, the automobile workers in the United States, the metal workers in South Africa, they're all connected to each other. We live in a global world, with global production chains and a global working class. Sevim is aware of that. She has it in her, and she's right. When I was young, I always learned that only those who have the courage to dream have the strength to fight. And I have the courage to dream of a better society, of a fairer society, not as utopia, but something that is feasible. And that's why I'm fighting for it. 
That's a nice ending to the docu-series. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you Thank too, you very yeah. much. <laughs> the courage to dream, says Sevim. Inspiring. At night, I walk through Berlin and think about those words. You have to have the courage not to accept the situation as it is now. You have to have the strength to stand up for your conviction, the power of conviction. That's Sevim, and that's so many other people. Our world is made by labor and by engagement. In London and Berlin, I was able to speak with Grace and Sevim about the mutiny in the North. And it's no different in the South, I hear. But I also want to see that with my own eyes. The Trail of Mutiny leads me to Johannesburg in South Africa for the next episode.